All right, why don't you go ahead, grab your Bibles, open up to Luke 1. We'll start in verse 57 this morning. Luke 1, 57. Uh, as you're turning there, one of the most iconic images of the 20th century in America has got to be Charlie Brown preparing to kick the football that Lucy is holding for him. And, uh, of course, part of the indelible charm of that scene is that, that simple, innocent faith that Charlie Brown has, the the trust that he's placed in someone so clearly unworthy of it. Now, we're not like Charlie Brown for the most part. As a culture, we're a bit more on the skeptical side, maybe even cynical side. We don't want to be taken. We don't want to be had. Uh, And and so when, you know, the pop-up comes up on the screen that you've just won a $1,000 Amazon gift card, we We close the pop-up as quickly as possible before the virus infects us, and we're certainly not entering our credit card info to get the Amazon gift card. This is also probably why this culture of cynicism that we've got here is why companies and and churches and all these different groups have got to do team-building exercises. So we do things like, what's the most famous one, of course, the, the trust fall to see just how much trust do we really have in each other? Do I really trust my team, my colleagues? You know, at an appropriate level, different, different relationships require different, different trust, of course. In our culture, I think it's difficult for us to trust God as well because of this. I think we're guarded, maybe even jaded in some ways. Does my life show that I trust God? completely and comprehensively. How would I know? I mean, again, it, would, it would be seen. I, I could show it. Do I trust Lucy? Well, if I run up to try and kick the ball, the answer is yes. Do I trust my colleagues? Well, I'm going to close my eyes, cross my arms, and fall backwards. I did see a YouTube clip of somebody who fell forwards in this situation. It was not good, okay? The, the, the team was there, but you got to fall the right way or they're not going to catch you, so that happens. Our passage this morning looks at the trustworthiness of God, his faithfulness to his promises, past, present, and future. And the passage draws out for us, mostly implicitly, what we are to do with his trustworthiness, how we are to respond with a simple but better placed faith than Charlie Brown's. And instead of responding with jaded or guarded attitude. And it's going to do that by looking at the character of Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. Now, Zechariah, remember, had struggled to trust God, as many of us do, on the bare strength of his word. If you weren't here the first week of the series, the angel Gabriel comes out and says, hey, you're going to have a son. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And Zachariah goes, eh, we're pretty old. My wife's pretty old. I don't think this is going to happen. And so he's actually not able to speak at this point because of his doubt in that moment is a sign to him of what is coming. The question I want us to be asking ourselves as we study this passage together this morning, though, is this. Has God done enough to deserve our full trust? So with that question in mind, let's start to look at the passage, and we're going to kind of look at his, his faithfulness in the past, in the present, and in the future, at least from Zechariah's vantage point. So here, first of all, from verses 57 to 66, the past fulfillment, what we might call the already part of this, um, of our experience as Christians, what God has already done for us. Let me read verses 57 to 66. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son, Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They were going to name him after his father, Zechariah, but his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? 
for the Lord's hand was with him. Right, similar to last week, we get a little bit of a narrative introduction before we get into Zechariah's song. And this narrative introduction is all about the fulfillment of Gabriel's word. What he had said was going to happen all happens here. When it says, even right there at the start of the passage, when it was time, I mean, it reads literally as when the time was fulfilled, when the time reached its fullness. What time are we talking about? Of course, Elizabeth's period of gestation is part of it, but more importantly, uh, the fullness of time in terms of salvation history. Uh, When it's time for God's plan to get rolling in a different sort of way, a son is born. The neighbors and relatives of Elizabeth hear this and they share her joy, which is interesting because that is direct fulfillment of verse 14. Way back when, when Angel Gabriel had said, hey, this this, this baby's going to bring you joy, it's going to bring a whole lot of people joy. And we're starting to see that happen already. And why are they so... uh, Why are they rejoicing? It's because the Lord had shown her great mercy. And that uh, phrase there, if I can pull back the curtains on it a little bit, uh, it, it reads maybe a little more literally as the Lord magnified his mercy to her, made his mercy evidently great in her life. That's the same word that Mary used last week. Uh, When we talked about, in verse 46, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. The exact same word. It's interesting because that means that we do what God does, but we do it a little differently. God displays his glory, and we just zoom in on it for others. So when Mary says, in effect, come and glorify the Lord with me, what she's saying is, I'm going to take a magnifying glass to his mercy on display in my life. And that's what we're called to do as well. Now, Zechariah had stumbled a bit, as we said. When he first hears God's word, he responds with doubt. He didn't believe, but it said at that time that he and his wife were righteous. That they kept the law faithfully, and we see them continuing to do that as they bring their son to be circumcised and named on the eighth day. That's all according to the law. And I love this because the relatives who are there, they just don't even ask what the the kid's name is going to be. Like, you're just filling in the birth certificate, no problem. Okay, seven pounds, 12 ounces, born March 7th, 1230 a.m., name Zachariah. And and, and Elizabeth would be like, hang on now. Let's have a little conversation about this. Actually, his name is going to be John. And, and, And they freak out because this just isn't done. Like, I get that we do not understand this in this culture. Or in this culture, like, the weirder the name, the better... If you're going to give your kid a normal name, you've got to spell it funny, just so they've got, they got to spell it out every time they give their name for the rest of their lives. It's this like cruel trick we play on our kids, and I'm among the guilty. You can ask my, my daughters, Charis and Adil, if people <laughs> say their names right. I mean, okay, well, so we don't get this, but back then, look, you just got your dad's name. Like, that's just how this worked. Maybe, maybe grandpa's name or something. So while this was culturally indefensible, it was also spiritually inevitable. Why? Because this was an act of trust. This is obedience to verse 13, when Gabriel says, you're going to call him John. That's what, you know, again, an act of trust is obedience. That's what obedience is. But this is an act of trust in the face of societal pressure. I think that's just such a great example for us, especially as parents, since we're talking about a parenting moment here. As parents, we will frequently have to defy society's expectations in obedience to God. And we should be radically countercultural in the way we raise our children. I could give about 10,000 examples. I'll just pick one of my favorite ones, probably because I read three different articles about it this week, but that's the the smartphone problem, right? Just just the idea of giving your kid a a smartphone, like no questions asked, that's accepted, and it happens pretty young in our culture, and it's idiotic, it's just so dumb, because of of, of the the world of danger that that opens up, and so there's some things here where we just go, look, we're going to do this differently. Either you're getting a phone later, or maybe not at all, uh, or the way you get a phone is going to look different. And when a kid comes to you and is like, hey, Dad, nobody else in my class has to turn in their phone at 7 p.m. every night, we go, guess what? We, we don't do what society expects of us. Nobody else in class has to come to Dad and say, hey, can I download this app? Because, you know, it's locked and whatnot, but that's what we do in this household. Because it's terrifying otherwise. 
If you've got more questions about that, Kyle does a wonderful Parent You on parenting in a digital age. I'd highly encourage you to attend that. Because as I said, there's a world of danger out there. Well, what happens here? These relatives, that they turn and ask dad because mom's clearly lost it. So let's see what dad thinks. Of course, dad's going to want a junior at this point. So they make signs just as a reminder. That means he was not only mute but also deaf. Those usually go together. And so uh, what that means, though, they're making signs in here, means he has not heard what mom just said. So they're not saying, hey, Elizabeth just said uh, we're going to name this kid John. Do you agree with her? They're just saying, what do you want to name the child? And he writes, his name is John. That is emphatic, by the way, the way he writes this. It's very strong because this is by divine fiat. This is not personal choice at all. He doesn't say, we're going to call him John. His name will be John. His name is John because God has already named him. And this produces this sort of twin amazement among the crowd there. First of all, that dad who couldn't hear what mom said came up with the exact same crazy name and then also that he can now talk, which is kind of cool. Right? That's the most important part here. Uh, now, they miss the amazement. They're just glad that he can talk again. But what's truly amazing here, the, the greater miracle than his, than his mouth being opened again is the fact that he has learned to trust in a different way. That's the greatest miracle that we can see in our own lives. The sign has accomplished its purpose. The whole idea of him not being able to speak for a while, which reminds us, by the way, that this is not punishment, but discipline. There's a huge difference there. Punishment is punitive, but discipline is formative. What God has done for Zechariah has been formative in his life. He has grown as a result of it, and so his mouth is open. We know that he trusts in a different way because he obeys God's word here and names his child John. Mouth is open, this miracle, and and he does what you ought to do when your mouth is open, which is to praise God. And before we get to the content of that praise, Luke turns us back to the crowd for a moment. We see that awe has overcome them. Really, fear has overcome them is the word that's used there. And we talked about what it means to fear God last week. But basically, fearing God just means you you, you get God. (laughs) Like you finally have a right understanding of just who he is and who I am in comparison. And it makes you a little nervous, and it ought to. And that's how they feel here. Based on what we've just seen, I mean, like what is God about to do? Or the question they actually even ask, what is this child going to be? You can just hear them going, I think we've got to take this a bit more seriously than we have been. It's exactly what's happening here. Luke pulls us aside, which the writers of the New Testament don't often do, but gives us this sort of editorial comment, by the way, the Lord's hand was with them. Like they were right to be a little unnerved here. And that comment sets the expectation of greater things yet to come. We have seen plenty of fulfillment just in these few verses. Plenty of fulfillment has already happened, but there's some some still to come. So let's keep reading, verses 67 uh, to 75. We're going to see this kind of present or ongoing fulfillment of his promises, his ongoing faithfulness, what we could call the already and not yet. God has already started to keep his promises. He has not yet completely kept them in all of these ways. We'll talk about what that means as we go, but let me read for us, 67 to 75. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Luke tells us that this is not just praise, but Holy Spirit-inspired prophecy. So this is the very word of God about the coming of salvation and the coming of Jesus Christ. 
What does he do? He begins by blessing God because God has visited his people. He's come to his people. That phrase, that whole idea of visiting his people has a rich history in the Old Testament. You can see it in many places. When God visits people, he's either coming to bring judgment or favor. And of course, here at least, it is favor. Probably the closest parallel, and and Zechariah may have been thinking of this passage when he says this, would be Genesis 21 verse 1, which is up on the screen. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Again, his faithfulness to keep his promises there. You can see this is an especially good parallel because it involves God keeping his promises, the unfolding plan of redemption in the birth of a child, specifically, which is what we've got going on here too. Once again, God has visited his people to show favor for the purpose of redemption through a pregnancy. There, Sarah has got the child of promise within her, Isaac, which means Abraham's line is going to go on and the nation of Israel will be established and Messiah will come through him. Here, what pregnancy are we talking about? Well, John's not, or, uh, Zachariah's not talking about John. He's not talking about Elizabeth's pregnancy. He's talking about Mary's pregnancy. We know this because of what he says. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. A little hint, by the way, that we mentioned Mary comes from the, the house of Aaron. She's got priestly blood in her. But based on what he says here, most likely also has the Davidic blood too. It's not just Joseph who's a descendant of David, but Mary uh, as well. That would be our closest uh, that we get to a clue there anyway. And what do we mean by the horn of salvation? That's not usually how we talk. Again, an image that shows up a lot in the Old Testament. It comes from an ox's, you know, powerful horns, able to defeat its enemies just by a simple head thrust and all of that. Well, later it gets taken uh, for a warrior who would be wearing a horned helmet. It's got that same sense of strength and ability to deliver, and, and then eventually it comes to stand for a king, Right, the, the, the warrior king who's going to deliver his people, specifically David, of course, or uh, the king who sits on David's throne. You can see that uh, Psalm 132, for example, Israel is crying out to God for him to fulfill his promises and not forget his covenant with David, and here's how God responds in Psalm 132. Here, I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown, the language of enemies coming up there as well. Well, what the psalmist there had asked for back in Psalm 132, God has now given. Jesus is present in Mary's womb, and so we get the fulfillment of all these prophecies, which Zechariah mentions in verse 70, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, that has come to pass, more fulfillment. The horn of salvation, this, this deliverer, is already present. Here's the already. But he's also present in utero, 12 weeks gestation. So it's safe to say there's some not yet at the same time. The, the salvation, the deliverance that this guy is coming to bring, well, that has not yet happened completely, not yet been accomplished. There's that tension between the already and not yet. And we see the not yet piece too, especially in how Zacharias speaks of salvation. Because he doesn't speak of it in spiritual terms, he speaks of it in material terms. And when you're going to save us from our enemies, from those who hate us, that's tricky language for us. I don't think we do so well with language like this. We're going to lean in a bit here. There are two kind of related issues that show up here. And when we start with the first one, which is what do we do with this enemies language? I don't think that's a, quite the right way to speak for the most part. I mean, the idea of, of enemies, well, it doesn't fit our context here, at least. Right? Like in our culture, at this moment, this doesn't fit. You think you got enemies in this culture, it's probably your problem and not theirs. You know what I mean? Where you got this whole like war on Christmas thing. Like, if you think that the cashier who wished you a happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas is your enemy, like that's on you, that's not on them right? Like, you see what I mean, though? It's, it's easy to be a Christian in 21st century U.S. of A. So this enemy stuff is like, I don't think I got an enemy in this culture. That's not the uniform experience of the church, though, of course. We could point to a, a lot of other experiences. Well, I mean, think of this. Even Zechariah, as he's prophesying, 
he can probably see Roman soldiers or standards right there where he's talking about, which means there is an occupying enemy force hostile to his faith and his people right there in front of him. And so he borrows this language of enemies from the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 106 is not up on the screen, but if you were to look at Psalm 106, which uses that language of God visiting his people again, goes on to say in verse 10, from the hand of our enemy you have delivered us. And why does Zechariah borrow this sort of language from the Old Testament? Because he's got a similar experience happening right there. Psalm 106 is all about God rescuing Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And now Israel is effectively slaves to Rome. So he sure he borrows the language. Again, though, it's like a little more complicated because you get this weird national spiritual overlap when the Old Testament people speak like this. Because back then, Israel was a nation and the people of God. And there is no nation that is the people of God at this point. So if Assyria invades Israel, uh, that means both nationally but spiritually they're being attacked. We don't have that. Like, you go to World War I or something like that, and you got German and French soldiers fighting each other. It may be national enemies and brothers in Christ, which is really complicated. We're just not going to get into that, all right? But so you, you see, uh, even with that, couldn't others use it? You know, you strip away that national idea. Let's, let's take out that complication. Aren't there people today who still could use the language of enemies? I'm thinking, you know, like 19th century here in the U.S., down in the South. I don't think slaves would think of their slave owners as enemies, especially the ones who are particularly cruel. Those who are being trafficked today for sex or other purposes would think of the traffickers as being enemies, absolutely. Abortionists. Or what about those who are experiencing real persecution? Watching their family get carted off to concentration, re-education camps in places like North Korea and China. But you go, all right, I, I mean, I think the language of enemy is, is fair here. One more complication, just to show you how difficult this enemy language is, our enemies now might be our family later. You could have a prison guard in China who comes to Christ. That could happen, yeah. We know this because the most famous Christian in history was a religious terrorist until he met the living Christ on the road to Damascus. He was the enemy of the church until he was the head of the church, basically. The greatest peacetime evangelist the world's ever seen. So you see all these companies, one of the reasons we don't, we don't take matters into our own hands and we certainly don't fight with the world's weapons because we're going, this is complicated, guys. This is really complicated. We're going to trust God with this. But, but I think we can say there still might be enemies. There might be enemies in this world. Now that kind of raises the second issue, though, which is this then tension between the spiritual and material fulfillment of God's promises, which I mentioned just in passing last week. Daryl Bach, commenting on this passage, says it, and I think this is a great quote. He says, salvation unites the, the real world, the, the physical world, with the world of the heart and the world of heaven. To remove any element is to miss Luke's picture of salvation. To remove the heart in heaven demotes salvation to politics, God help us. To remove the earthly hope leaves a chasm between justice in the world and the individual's response to God. God's salvation is not intended to be a private affair, but it's designed to show, to magnify, God's greatness to all creation. Heaven and earth cannot be divorced in redemption. By the way, this is kind of an aside, but one of the reasons I believe Christianity is true and undeniably true is Christianity is the only worldview under the sun that holds these two in tension, the material and the spiritual. Every other worldview that you get, whether it's religious or secular, it is going to somehow emphasize one to the detriment of the other. So you look at many of them are going to have this, hey, it's the next life that matters, you know, why, are, why is poverty so brutal in India, for example? Because that prior class is like, look, just hang on to the next life, guys. Just hang on to that. This one doesn't matter. You, you didn't do so well. Wait for the next one. So you get this kind of uh, so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good pie in the sky when you die kind of uh, response to the world's problems. Or you get the other side. Which is, this world is all we have. There is no next life. So you're going to work really hard to alleviate suffering in this world, but it's ultimately a hopeless effort. 
Like maybe you're trying to cure diseases or something like that, and that's great, and we should be doing that, but what about the people who die before the disease is cured? It stinks for them. No hope beyond the grave. Christianity holds these two in tension, but, but we, as Christians, struggle to hold them in tension. It's like the first time you put your little three-year-old on one of them pony rides or something, you gotta stand next to them. Maybe you've never done this. I've had to do this many times, okay? And why? It's because you put them on, and they go like this, and then you straighten them up again and they go like this, <laughs> right? So they're either gonna fall off the right side or the left side. It's very difficult to just sit in the middle and that's how we are, always in danger of falling off to the right, overcorrecting and falling off on the left side instead. Let me just give you an example, certainly not what Zachariah is talking about here, but I think it's an important one and one that the church has tended to be silent and poor <laughs> in, in responding to and that's mental health issues. Mental health issues are a significant crisis in our culture, and yet <laughs> we tend to fall into one of two camps, responding to it as only a spiritual issue or only a physical issue. And then look at what happens as a result. Talking to somebody who's suffering from PTSD, anxiety, depression, ADHD, something like that. Well, we, on the one hand, we could over-spiritualize this. If we over-spiritualize this, it's going to stigmatize the struggle that this person is experiencing. Why do you have this? Because you don't trust God enough. That's a more miserable comforter than Job's friends, by the way. I would not want to be that person, and yet so many of us are. Plus, you're going to keep people from some God-given help. Like, I'm so grateful for the medical profession that's figured some of this stuff out. Like, if your brain, because you were traumatized as a child, has been cooking in juices that it was not supposed to cook in for that long, yeah, things are going to be a little bit fried. And if there's something that we can do to help that chemically while we address it spiritually at the same time, why wouldn't we? Don't you think God would want that? Absolutely, he would. Or we could under-spiritualize. This is only physical. The whole problem here was just get you on medication. The only answer to the problem without looking into the possibility of the demonic, first of all, but then also just the deepest spiritual needs. I mean, I think anxiety and depression often have a spiritual component, and we need to talk about that. Absolutely. You see how easy it is to fall off the horse on both sides? We do that in so many areas. Zechariah holds the tension nicely. The guy's got the pony ride down. Because he prophesies a comprehensive salvation. Even just look at verse 74. Just one verse has them both there. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and enable us to serve him without fear. There's both. We've got political, societal change on the one hand, and spiritual transformation, being brought into a right relationship with God on the other. This is why we sing, and we're going to sing in a moment, and I hope you sing it a little differently this time, long lay the world in sin and error, pining till he appeared, and the soul felt its worth, the spiritual side. And then like the very next verse, we sing, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. It's almost like Charles Wesley knew his Bible, knew this tension right here. And by the way, we know he did, because without the Wesleys, abolition doesn't happen in England. Like, they're the spiritual force that leads to this, because they understood both have got to be there. But in both, we also see that tension between the already and the not yet. Partial ongoing, inaugurated fulfillment of God's promises. In glory, there will be perfect justice. In this life, no, but we work towards it. By faith in Christ, we serve him without fear, mostly in holiness and righteousness, in growing holiness and righteousness. Because the penalty of sin has been paid and the power of sin is broken, the presence of sin lingers in our hearts and rears its ugly head more often than we would like, but hopefully less and less as the years go by. Don't miss the centerpiece of this whole section, though, just before we turn the corner to the next one. Uh, where does this whole comprehensive salvation come from? The center point of it all is verse 72. The whole reason he redeems us, the description of the salvation, to show mercy. Same phrase we saw back in verse 58. In that second, we're going to see it in the next section too. God's mercy motivates all that he does for us. 
but then motivates our entire response as well, all that we do. Jesus is gonna say this in Luke's gospel even. Luke 6, 36, be merciful, just as your father is merciful, that God's mercy transforms everything. The mercy that we experience at the cross of Christ motivates our love for God, which displays itself in holiness, and our love for others, which displays itself in justice. Takes us to the future fulfillment then. The last section, the not yet, the stuff that just hasn't happened from Zechariah's perspective. Let me read verses 76 to 80 for us. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord, prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So Zechariah here, he gets intensely personal, addresses his newborn son directly. You can picture him holding this infant son in his arms, probably bouncing a little bit so that John's not crying while he's prophesying over him. But he explains at this point exactly what John will do. He's really just expounding Gabriel's words to him. But what John's going to do in the future, the role that he'll play in salvation history as it continues to unfold. You'll notice it's in the future tense throughout. You will be called, you will go. I mean, it's, it's future stuff that's happening here. There's no fulfillment yet, but there's been enough fulfillment in what he's already seen, like the birth of a son in his old age, enough fulfillment to know and trust what's coming, that God will be faithful to his promises. So John is going to be a prophet who goes before Jesus. Here the word Lord is talking about Jesus. Probably the first time in Luke's gospel that we get this, where, wait, this Jesus is in fact the Lord because he's preparing the way for the Lord specifically. How? How does he prepare the way for Jesus and Jesus' ministry? He gets the people of God ready for the mechanism of salvation. How we lay hold of the forgiveness that God offers us through repentance. John comes preaching repentance specifically. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. John's baptism pictures the washing away of sin. Jesus' baptism was a little different, right? When we believe, we're buried with Christ in his death and raised to new life in him. That's a little different. John's going before him, preparing us for the whole idea of salvation by grace through repentance and faith. Not works the law. Not I'm good enough, but no, I'm positively bad. (laughs) So bad that I'm going to need somebody else, I think. Now, we don't get more detail here because Zachariah's got no idea what's coming. Like Mary last week. Like the the Messiah's been born. This is the horn of salvation from the house of David. That's all I got at this point. he, He is not here thinking of a substitute, especially a divine substitute that God would become flesh precisely so that he could die in our place for our sins, receive our punishment, we might be welcomed in his place. Lest we miss it, Luke gives it to us again. What's the foundation of all this? Why is it that the divine substitute would come to do all this? Well, because of the tender mercy of our God. God's grace made visible in what he calls the rising sun, This, by the way, is why we sing, O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Because the word that's used, rising sun, really means that which springs up. So I like the translation day spring. I think that's a really good one. And of course, yeah, it's talking about the sun because in verse 79, this thing that springs up, which the sun does most mornings, shines, gives us light and all that. But what's interesting is that that word for that thing that springs up is a bit of a pun. It gets used in a lot of different ways. What else springs up, by the way? Like a tender shoot from the stump of a tree that's been cut down. I mean, this is the shoot from the stump of Jesse, the the righteous branch that the prophets talk about. If you were to sing the other verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that we rarely, rarely sing, it would be O Come, Thou Rod of Jesse. <laughs> that, that's the other thing that springs up there, this shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now, interestingly, th- th- this 
shoot of Jesse, the, the, this rising sun that comes for us uh, because we're in a bleak situation, Zechariah includes himself in the bleak situation of verse 79. He's going to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet. See, he puts himself in the group to guide our feet into the path of peace. Even righteous Zechariah, who, who has kept the law perfectly, needs God's tender mercy, ultimately displayed in the blood of Christ to be saved, and so do we. Of course, what was past for Zechariah, or what was future for Zechariah, is now past for us, what he describes here. Not only John's work, but Jesus' work as well. If I can confuse you even more, because that's my goal here most Sunday mornings, John, if Zechariah lived in the, the, the time of the already, not yet, not yet, and we live in the already, already, not yet. Got that? I can move on? You see what I mean, though? Uh, Jesus had already come into the world, although he's still in the womb at this point, but he had not yet lived the perfect life, died, been raised again, ascended, poured out his spirit on all people. And he's not yet come again to consummate his perfect kingdom. But for us, of course, Jesus has already come and has already lived and died, been resurrected, ascended, poured out his spirit, but has not yet come to consummate his perfect kingdom. So here's why I, I draw out that confusing point, is that the greater fulfillment that we have seen should inspire a greater trust in us, a complete, comprehensive trust truly evidenced in our lives. We can both see and understand better than Zechariah did. And that's important because look, this whole story, what we've just done, that whole passage this morning is about Zechariah learning to trust more. Gabriel says, you're gonna have a son. He goes, I don't think that, that, that works. And now he goes, okay, I get it. And I see what you're about to do. The fulfillment of that pretty simple promise led him to greater trust. We have seen a much greater fulfillment, so we should have an even greater trust than Zechariah did. And we can also understand what he had no idea about, the, the two-stage coming of the king and the kingdom that he brings, this kingdom that he has inaugurated. Christ reigns in our hearts but has not consummated because clearly not everything is in submission to Jesus yet. And that kingdom is flesh and blood, interestingly, because there will be a physical, bodily resurrection at the end of time. It's societal. It's earthly, like it's made out of dirt. We know this because we don't go to a disembodied heaven in glory. We go to the new heavens that are unified with the new earth. And the new heavens meaning it's spiritual as well. It's a comprehensive salvation. In Zechariah's prophecy, I mean, just think of how many different ways he describes God's salvation. Just in our passage right here. God visits and stays with his people. He saves us from our enemies. He fulfills his ancient prophecies and promises. He delivers us to serve him without fear. He forgives our sins. He shines light in our darkness and he guides us in the paths of peace. We could add other statements from other places in the New Testament, but that's pretty comprehensive, right? If salvation is that comprehensive, then it should be that comprehensively worked out in our lives. Which means Jesus isn't just for the religious part of our lives. Jesus isn't just the box we check on Sunday mornings to show that we're Christians. Jesus is the everything from top to bottom. If we reduce salvation to forgiveness, like I just need my ticket to heaven, then we reduce trust and obedience to mere belief. Just need to pray some sinner's prayer that somebody made up like 50 years ago and that's what we need to do. I need to walk some aisle or sign my name on some dotted line. But if we understand salvation comprehensively as God intends, we expand that trust to include everything. Jesus is the king of every area without exception. I mentioned parenting already. What a good example of that, right? To be a Christian parent doesn't just mean that we get a few additions like we make our kids go to church, and a few subtractions, like we try and teach them not to cuss. It is a whole different paradigm, right? We're not driving a different model of the same car. It's an entirely different vehicle going in an entirely different direction to an entirely different destination. 
So what happens, we reduce parenting to just the religious part, and that means to be a Christian parent is just make sure your kids go to church and youth group, maybe you bow your head before a meal, but at the end of the day, you're pretty much just raising them to be a functioning member of a godless society. That can't be the goal, right? That's totally different from going, no, 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 I want to shepherd my child's heart and introduce them to the good shepherd. That's all I can do. My job is to make sure when they leave my care, they know as much about Jesus as possible. And that may mean they know a little less about STEM or something as a result because the Jesus thing matters more. And that's the focus and the priority of all that we do. Ditto marriage. I mean, look at how our culture pursues marriage today. Marriage is about my happiness, which is why I stay married so long as my spouse makes me happy. And if she stops doing that, think of how different it is if Jesus is the Lord of your marriage, though. Because then your marriage is not about you in the slightest. It is about the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus' love for the church and the church's submission to Christ. That's what our marriages are meant to be a temporary parable of. Or your vocation. I mean, how would we look at vocation? Jesus isn't in it. We haven't brought him to the center of it all. Well, uh, vocation is something we do to earn money because we've got to buy food. Nothing wrong with that. That's a real thing, right? But it's also about my self-fulfillment, about self-actualization, probably kind of making a name for myself in what I do here, whether that's stay-at-home mom or student or CEO, whatever it is, versus if Jesus is king, using my talents and the gifts that he has graciously given me to glorify him in serving others. And by the way, that's true for those of you who are in school. Your kids are sitting here going like, all right, I like tuned out because this sermon is too long. But your education You're stewarding this gift that God has given you so that you're prepared to do the work that he's going to call you to do later in life. All of a sudden, your math test takes on a different flavor if Jesus is king. Speaking of vocation, speaking of the money that that brings us in, what does it look like if your checkbook is under the kingship of Christ? It looks different than this, by the way. What we do here in our culture, that's for sure. If if Jesus is just the king of the religious part, then he gets the religious part of my money. We call that a tithe. He gets my 10%, on average 2.3% in the U.S., but that's cool. We'll pretend it's 10%, and that's it, because that's what I owe him, because he's the king of the religious part of my life. If he's the king of every part of my life, he gets 100%. And again, I'll hold back just a little bit, because I've got to feed my family and keep the lights on. It's not tithe the part, but surrender the whole if Jesus is king. Or a big one in our culture today, this is one that, again, we haven't worked out very well. What about our bodies? Again, I'm not a disembodied soul. (laughs) I'm an embodied soul, and I will be an embodied soul in glory. What is my body if Jesus is king over it? Right now, our bodies are a vehicle for self-expression, primarily sexually, in other areas as well. That's it. Versus being the temple of the Holy Spirit if I belong to Christ, at the very least, the image of God. That's a different thing, isn't it? Let me give you one more. I wasn't going to mention this one, but then Christianity Today published an article saying that Trump should be impeached, removed from office, either by a trial in the Senate or by uh, an election. This caused quite a stir among evangelicals. You want to go to intramural uh, debate, publish an article like that in the premier Christian magazine in the country. I'll just give you my aside real quick. Uh, I like the article personally um, because they wrote the same article back in 1998 about Clinton. And I think they're the only institution in the entire United States that said both for both equal circumstances. Everybody else has played a partisan game, and they said, look, if we said it then, we have to say it now also. I don't think they should have said it in either case. I think that's too much of wedding uh, of faith in politics. I don't think it's useful for us to do that. But I appreciate that in a culture of unmitigated hypocrisy, at least they were genuine. And good for them on that. But here's the thing. If God were to give 11th and 12th commandments, it would be don't comment and don't ever read the comments. <laughs> I'm a pastor, so I took one for the team here and I read the comments, okay? And it was as depressing an experience as I've ever had in my life because what did it show? 
What did, uh, what did the very partisan responses to this article show about the sorry state of the church in America? It showed us this, that we are far more passionate about either defending Trump or denigrating Trump than we are about declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's true of some of us in this room, right? Like, go on some Facebook feeds. Why? Because we do accountability here. We're going to speak into each other's lives. Which one are you actually more passionate about? Which one do you spend more time debating with your neighbors? Is Jesus king? And by the way, if Jesus is king, that's your politics. Like, it's just okay, right? Trump's response, I'm I'm like going way off here. But Trump tweeted out after this thing where he was all angry. He's like, what do you guys think? Warren and Sanders are going to help you? Nobody's done more to help the, the evangelical church than I have. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't even care. I read one great response. They were like, by the way, if you've read Matthew 16, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The only politician who gets our absolute allegiance is the king. It's a good reminder for us if Jesus really is king. Do you see, though, the comprehensive salvation that God has worked for us, a a record of faithfulness greater than what Zachariah knew should lead to an evident, complete, and comprehensive trust displayed in our obedience to him. Like Charlie Brown, we see the football that he's holding and he's not Lucy, and we run for it because we know he is faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we are ever so grateful that you're king a depressing world we would live in if you were not king. How could we possibly face all that Zechariah was speaking about? The fact that there are very real enemies of the kingdom of God in this world, whether they be demonic powers or people who are taken by them. How could we face that? The injustice and the poverty and the disease and the death if we did not have the hope that you are coming again to set things right. But Lord, would you help us live like we believe that? Live like we believe that you are king and that you are king over everything because we know how the story ends and the story ends with every knee bowing and every tongue acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and it ends with everything being brought under your rule and reign and what a privilege we have that we can live that truth now in the time of the already but not yet that we can be signposts of the coming kingdom. Lord, that's our heart's desire. Make it true in us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen.